So welcome to this uh, lesson in mixed language programming. Uh, just going to lay out my tool here. Um, so today we are going to discuss two things. So first, the section will be on combining uh, Python and Fortran. Um, so to, to take advantage of the, the benefits of both of these languages at the same time. Uh, and the second part will be on some of the tools you can use to uh, make your build uh, the development environment more efficient when you are building, especially Fortran code and perhaps also Python code. So let's start with mixed language programming. Uh, so in this course, we have been using Python uh, and uh, also at the final le lessons now also Fortran. These are very different kind of uh, languages. So Python is a, an interpreted language where you translate one line by line. Uh, Fortran is a language which you uh, compile to machine code and execute directly on the processor. Uh, to combine these languages, is, uh, it's not a super easy task. Uh, but the idea is that you can compile Fortran code into libraries that you can use as Python modules. Uh, Python supports uh, integration of other um, libraries into Python using a special uh, Python API. So to be, to be able to integrate a library, you need to kind of provide a, an interface to Python um, for your uh, Fortran module or, or a C module for that matter. And uh, this can be a complicated task. So, um, so the idea is that you create a C library or the shared library uh, with the, all the calls necessary to implement the Python API. So you have to set it up using um, uh, calls to different codes of the Python API to kind of provide a functionality and then call your link in your Fortran code into the, the, this Python shared library, which you then load into your environment. And, and this, this mechanism is also called as, ex, as extension modules. And uh, many of the modules in Python are implemented uh, like extension modules. So they internally implemented in C, uh, and then they expose a Python interface uh, to Python code. And uh, for example, the NumPy uh, library or modules are all implemented in C and provide us extension modules to Python. But below here, you have a, an example of how an extension module for summing values can look like. So you have to include a Python header file in C and then you have to declare your uh, functions in a, in a very special way. In this case, uh, you have to specify pi object here, which is a return type, uh, a lot of pointer arithmetic. Here is your functionality. And then you have to return uh, the value here by calling the Python API to kind of create the corresponding Python data type. And then you have to compile, compile all of this to a uh, separate module. But there is a, unfortunately, a very much easier way to do this. Uh, in the Anaconda distribution that you have downloaded and hopefully are using, there is a tool called F2Py, and it stands for Fortran to, to Python. Uh, and it compile or translate Fortran code and generates all this C code automatically for you. And, uh, and uh, also creates a Python extension modules uh, that you can automatically um, import into Python. So it, it's very simple to use. So we, we will start with a really simple Fortran example. So I have a subroutine here called simple. It has three uh, variables, uh, input variables coming in, A, B, and C. The first two are input variables and the, and the third is an output variable. And using the normal Fortran syntax here, I add an attribute to my variables here called intent in, 
which tells the compiler that these variables are coming in and are not to be modified inside the subroutine. Intent out tells the compiler this is an output variable and will be assigned in the subroutine. Uh, F2Py reads these intent statements and is able to translate that into correspondent Python code. So for example, an output variable in, in Fortran will be uh, returned on the left side of an equal sign. So it will be a function basically. And the A and B that are input, they will be provided as the parameters to the function in Python. <clears throat> so how do you use this tool? So the tool is called from the command line here. So uh, ignore this uh, exclamation mark. This is just because I'm in a notebook here. And I, by using the exclamation part, part I'm, I'm com um, calling a, a command line tool that is outside the, the Python interpreter. So if you open a terminal, you can just type f2py. And the first time you specify is a name of your extension module. So in this case, it's simple. And then I have a dash C that means compile. And then I provide my Fortran code here, in this case, uh, simple.f90. So let's execute this here and see if it works. Now it does a lot of magic here. Uh, and what it does is actually, it looks at the Fortran code and generate and parses that Fortran code and generates uh, the C code here that they will be created for the extension module. <coughs> and you see now here that uh, at, at the end, if everything goes well, there should be a final statement called removing build directory temp something. It is a bit different on different platforms here. But if you look at the, in, in your home directory now, you have uh, something looks like this simple.cpython 36x8664 Linux GNU SO. And SO stands for shared object. And that is a dynamic library similar to a DLL file in Windows. It's a machine code uh, library that can be loaded into memory and executed. And this library now contains all the necessary uh, Python interface code to be able to be loaded from a Python interpreter. So to use that inside uh, my Python code, I can just now use the import statement here. So import statement will read this shared extension module, just like any other Python module. Uh, and another nice thing with the F2Py uh, the translator is that it actually generates documentation code as well for your Python code. So if I, if I just print underscore underscore doc underscore underscore, it will also provide printed documentation here. And this is for on the module level. And then you have this simple uh, subroutine here. It also has uh, documentation. So let's see what happens if I run this. You see here, this module simple is auto-generated. And it contains the function C equals to simple A and B. And here you see it translated output variable to a return value to, on the left side of the equal sign. And if we execute here, you can see it will print the documentation for the simple subroutine. Uh, and it, it says that it has two parameters, A and B. There are floating point values. And it returns C, which is also a floating point value. And uh, of course, you, you should try and see if this works. So here I had declared two variables, A and B. And then I tried to calculate C here. Uh, by calling my Fortran subroutine. And you see here, now it returns 84. It looks kind of not so impressive here, but it, this actually uh, goes on the way from Python, uh, takes the two val uh, variables from Python, sends them into the Fortran routine, and the Fortran routine returns the sum of these two values. So it, it did a round trip uh, through Fortran. Um, uh, the next part is here, of course, the, the most used data types in communicated with Fortran code is arrays. And this is also uh, something that the F, uh, F2Py is uh, extremely good at. So I have a subroutine here, matrix multiply. So I will take the, use my, uh, the MATMOL routine in, in Fortran to do the matrix multiply. So in this example here, I need to provide some size information here as well. So R and S are the dimensions of A and T is the, um, the columns of uh, 
B and C. And then I have input variables are A and B, and it will return a C here, which is a, a result of the matrix multiply. And then I just call C equals to map mode A and B. So first step, I will create a, um, a module called RR array one, and then it compiles my Fortran code F, R, um, R1 dot F90. So now I translate everything into C and it seems to have been successful here. So it compiled it and removed the build directory. So in the next step here, I will just import it here. And you can see here now that the module R is auto-generated with F2Pi. And it uh, described this contains a subroutine called matrix multiply with the following parameters here. And if you look at uh, the documentation for the, the matrix multiply function, it looks something like this. And please note that the last variables here, R, S, and T, which denote the sizes of the arrays, has been uh, contained in the bracket. And that means that you don't have to specify them when calling from Python. So F2Pi automatically figures out which of these variables are used for uh, providing the sizes for the arrays and, it, uh, and will provide those automatically. For example, when you send in a NumPy array, that will automatically provide it to the subroutine, actual subroutine call in Fortran. But the, the function in Python, you only have to send the actual uh, array variables over. You don't have to specify any size information at all. Um, and it runs, uh, and here you can see it is a two dimensional array with a floating point type. Uh, and you also get the bounds here uh, are required to, to use this. So let's see here if uh, we can uh, call this routine. And now there is a important difference between NumPy and Fortran. I, I pr probably mentioned this before. Uh, Fortran stores arrays column-wise and NumPy stores them row-wise. And when we, we are calling Fortran routines, uh, we need to, to pass them over with the same ordering. And the only difference from a normal Python NumPy code is that you need to specify order equals to F here uh, when you call the subroutine. And that will tell NumPy to create the arrays uh, using a column-wise orientation, a storage format. And then they will be passed over like uh, uh, as pointers to the array, so there is no copying involved when you're using the order F. So you can also not use the order F. Uh, F2Pi will function perfectly well without this. Uh, the only thing is that um, it will make a copy be before calling the subroutine. So it will kind of translate it automatically to Fortran, but that is costly. So it's better that you provide this information to the NumPy, when you create the NumPy arrays, then they, these arrays will be passed by reference and with pointers instead. So there is no uh, efficiency loss. So let's see if we run this here. Uh, it seems to be working. Uh, there is, however, one thing that is uh, a bit problematic here. If you look here, I printed IDC before an IDC after here. Uh, so actually, this assignment here will create a new array here. So this, this uh, array will never be used because it will automatically be created here. And that's why you see that they are different here in memory. So you, you don't have to specify this at all. So I can just uh, skip this uh, and run it again. It will produce the same results. Now the C is already here, so, but this is, this is not necessary. However, sometimes you don't want to, uh, uh, this can be a, a pro uh, efficiency issue here, especially if you have really large array, that it will make a new array when returning back. So we can fix this as well. So in the next example here, we have a matrix multiply two, uh, the same parameters here and the C as well. 
But now instead of uh, writing intent out, we uh, specify in out instead. And the same declaration otherwise. This has a bit different effect. So in this case, uh, this will allow uh, the Python code or the Fortran code to write to the actual C array in, in Python directly without any copying. So let's say if we compile it here. Uh, now you can see also that the, the function is a bit different here. So now in this case, instead of returning the, the C array on the left side of the function call, you have A, B, and C as three parameters. Uh, so when you do this, it's, uh, you, you won't return anything out, but you can modify the C inside your code. So let's see at the actual declarations here. So now you see A, B, and C. And you can also see that C here is an in and out array with the bounds R and T. Uh, and now you can see here, now I have created C here, and I will pass it over to Fortran. And the Fortran routine will now return the result into this uh, C array here. So if we run this, now you can see that C is identical in both before and after. Uh, and it's also uh, updated from being zero to having 1200 here inside. So it was updated inside a routine. So in this example here, uh, there is no copying being done at all. So all the arrays are passed over to Fortran the memory allocated for these different number arrays uh, are updated or read by Fortran directly. And, and in the case of C, uh, the memory is written by Fortran directly. So in this case, you can benefit from the Fortran speed uh, directly without any copying of the data at all. So, and this is important if you have, uh, because Python is already a lot slower than Fortran and you don't want to have more copying going on before you actually call your Fortran routine to speed up your code. So the important here to, to note is that you have to specify the arrays that being passed as order F, and then you should use the in out declaration here. Let's see here, I go back again. This here is very important, in out, not out, but in out. You can specify all the arrays as in out, then you can modify them inside your, your Python code, but uh, to, be, to kind of uh, make sure that you don't do anything unexpected, you should kind of only have in on your input arrays and in out on stuff like you that you modify inside your routine. Uh, another thing that this is nice you, that you can, uh, the modules you create in Fortran can be translated uh, in, in their entirety by F2Pi. So in this case here, I created a module matrix and I, I put all, both of my subroutines here inside my, uh, my module. And then I can compile my module here, uh, matrix F90 and, and F2Pi will look at the module structure and, and recreate that in, in uh, Python, in, in the extension module. So it's a very similar, uh, the module will look like the, the Fortran module identically. So all the subroutines contained will be provided inside this module. So if you look here, import matrix, you can see here that we have a Fortran 95 module containing a module called matrix. And this contains two functions here, matrix multiply and matrix multiply two. And here you can see matrix multiply and the second routine here, matrix multiply two, the documentation for those. The only bit Odd thing here is that when you compile your code here, you specify a, a module name here, and that is the uh, name of the module you load. And then the Fortran module will be a sub module of that. So you, you kind of get matrix dot matrix. So you can have an auto module containing several modules of Fortran code. Uh, so you should name your auto module something, perhaps your uh, my application, and then you have dot matrix inside. So uh, kind of looks strange if you have matrix dot matrix. Uh, so I just delete that module here first. So what I usually do when I have Fortran modules that I have provided inside a single module is that you 
I use the from matrix import star. Then all the modules inside the Fortran will be provided as separate modules in this case. So the matrix module, uh, you can call directly by specifying matrix dot matrix multiply. So this is a bit easier to, or equivalent to the code you have in, in, in the Fortran um, model, module. So like this. Uh, so that was a bit about uh, mixed language programming. Uh, I don't go too much deeper. There are also some, some um, uh, modules in Fortran that enables you to link together um, C in Fortran. But I, I, as I this is not a C course, I will not go through this. But you can be aware that it's also possible to uh, combine C and Fortran codes uh, by linking them together. Uh, there are also some other um, tools to generate uh, Python modules. Uh, notable, for example, C, there is something called Swig. There is also a, a special extension modules in, in the Boost Python libraries for C++. Uh, and all of these will, like FDPI, generate the necessary C code to create the extension module. So the next part here will be, let's see here. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, build environments. Oh, well. So, uh, so when you, now you have a, uh, hopefully most of you have been able to get the Qt creator going, uh, but you, um, when you develop code, uh, you, can, you can you use the Fortran compiler to compile your source code files. And in many cases, that could be enough that you just compile a single source code file. But in more cases, you, uh, when your project grows, uh, the task of kind of uh, building your program will be more and more complex. Uh, there are also requirements, for example, to be able to build your code on multiple platforms. So you want to perhaps support Windows, uh, Linux, and Mac uh, using the same kind of build system. Uh, you can, of course, solve this by creating shell scripts. Uh, the problem is that it's not necessarily these scripts can be run on all platforms because the Windows doesn't have a, it has a different syntax for their scripting language or bash scripts. So that's, you have to provide a special script for, for Windows. Uh, also, when you're using scripts to compile code, uh, usually those scripts will not, will be compile every single source code file every time. And that can be kind of, especially for large projects, this can be, half an hour or something to build the complete code. So we need to kind of figure out some tools that will use some tools to be able to efficiently use, uh, to, to compile and develop code. And there are two tools that I will go through today. And the one is make, and the other one is CMake. And they are related to each other because CMake uses make to build pro uh, programs, but can also use other build tools. Make is a standalone tool for handling uh, dependencies, uh, build dependencies, and uh, it, it builds your code in, a, in an efficient way. So we start with make. And, and uh, make is kind of a tool that it, it builds software, uh, basically uh, using a set of rules. So it, it doesn't have to be software, it kind of can handle any kind of workflows which involves files in different ways. And, and uh, the idea is that you define a rule that says that um, to build a certain thing, or to create something, you need to do this. So it kind of uh, uh, looks, uh, so you, you, you define what you want to do and, and a rule that uh, gets from one point to the goal. And the nice thing with make it can automatically handle 
dependencies and source for source code files. So you can have rules that uh, has multiple levels, and uh, it can detect if something changed. It knows what actually steps to take to actually come to build your software without unnecessarily doing too many things. Uh, it's available on all platforms. So uh, GNU Make, which is the uh, de facto standard for Make, is available on Windows, Mac, and uh, Linux. Um, it can be somewhat non-intuitive in the beginning, but um, when you get into the kind of uh, the idea or you grasp the concept of Make, uh, it, it kind of is very natural. So it has the, the notion of a, a target, and target is the goal that you want to achieve. And you, you specify a target name or a, a file or anything, and have a colon here. And optionally, you can also have dependencies here, uh, things that this target requires before it can be built. And under the next row here in this syntax is the recipe for um, achieving the target. So here you specify a command line of some sort that achieves this goal. Uh, one important thing is you need to have tab in your editor here to create the indentation. So this row here must be indented from the target line and it has to be using a tab. So an actual example here, uh, uh, is a recipe for uh, zipping a file. So in this case here, I have uh, my file.gc. This is my target. I want to achieve this. And it depends on a file on my, my uh, hard drive called my file.txt. And how do I kind of compress this file into this uh, archive here? So this is the recipe here. I, I uh, cap my file.txt, I pipe it through gzip and output put it to my file.gz. So this is my goal. This is the dependency. This, of course, I need my input file here. And this is how I achieve it. So I have, have, have this is in my indented line here, and this is the rule that the, the recipe for the rule. So uh, if we use make them, it looks like this. So in this case, you have a, the rules I provide in a make file, and that is actually have to be called make file uh, by default. So if you have a non-standard name of a, your rules, you have to specify that to the make file command as dash F, I think. Uh, but if you, if you have a file that looks like this, uppercase M make file, uh, make will automatically read this file. For, so it will look for that file in, in the current directory. And you see here, I have my text file here. And then I just type make. And then make opens the make file. Looks here, uh, OK, I have a target here. I want to create the, the myfile.gz. And you see here, it calls myfile.txt and creates this archive here. Uh, let's see here, it's a bit. Sorry for that. Uh, so when I do my ls again, you can see here, now there is a, my target file has been created and my old file is still here. If I do make again, and if, if I haven't changed any of these files and I press make, make will detect here, gc is up to date because my file hasn't been changed. Then it does nothing. So this is the nice thing when you have a, a large project where you, have, where you compile files, it will automatically uh, check for if it has to uh, do a certain step. If it's not necessary, it will not do it. So if you haven't changed your program, if you build your software and build it again, uh, the second time, if you haven't changed any source code, it will just say uh, the binary is up to date. I don't have to do anything. So what happens if I modify my, my uh, text file? So I just, to illustrate, I, I do a touch and my file here. So that will, uh, update the modification stamp of the file. And if I press make again, you can see here, okay, it detected my file has changed. That means that my archive also needs to be updated. So then I press make and then I, uh, it will execute that command again. 
so make will not look into files. So it will look at the modifications date, time, date, time stamps uh, only. And uh, so it's important that your clock is set correctly in your machines, because otherwise you can get um, uh, interesting effects. I think it has automatic uh, clock skew detection as well. So, so if we if we take the make file uh, uh, and, and I want to build a source code file, so the the, the procedure is that you build your executable that requires you to compile your source code files to object files. That is, uh, machine code files for each. Um, compilation um, source code file, and then you have to link together all these object files to an executable. Uh, object files, of course, they depend on source files. So here you can already, um, um, and also the executable depends on object files. So in this case here, you think, okay, this is a perfect case for make. So uh, it should be, you should be able to create rules for doing this uh, in your code in a make file. So if you look here, I have a, I want to build a binary called myprog. And myprog is a single source code file and it will depend on the object file dot myprog dot o. So how, how do I, uh, um, so this is the rule to kind of, create, yeah, sorry, this is the rule for creating my, my uh, executable. It depends on object file. And this is the rule to link together uh, the object file into our executable. And then I have a second rule here, myprog.o, it will depend on my source code file, myprog.f90. And I, I get to my myprog.o uh, by compiling my, my um, myprog.f90 using the C flag of the compiler. So you can see here, make a first look at here. This is what I want to achieve, an executable for myprog. Okay. It depends on myprog.o. So it will go and look, okay, myprog.o. If I want to create this target, I need, it depends on my source code file. And then it can, uh, to get to the O file, I will have to do this recipe. And then it, now it has it and it does the second line here. So running make now, if you look here, I have ls here, I have my make file containing this, this part here. And I have myprog here. Uh, the source code file. So if I make, the first thing it has to do is to create a object file. And you can see here that that is also what it does here. So g fortran minus c myprog.f90, this is this line here. So now you have an O file. And the second part here is, um, uh, it has to create the executable and it does that by linking them together. So g fortran myprog.o minus output myprog, which is the executable. So by using these rules, you get a, uh, a, a way of building your, uh, your binary. So for a single source code file, this can be kind of unnecessary, um, but it it's, uh, quickly pays off when you start adding files. So usually uh, a program depends on a lot of things. So in this case here, my prog uh, depends on a, a module uh, and, a, and the source code file my prog here. So then I need to create, uh, have two rules here. I have one rule to, to create a myprog.o, which is this, the one we had before. I have one rule, mymodule.o, which compiles the Fortran module file into this object file here. And then I have to link them all together. So for example, if you only modify a source code, if you have built a program before and you only uh, add a single file or modify a single file, the make will detect that uh, my prog is still up to date. Uh, I have a new rule here, my module.f90, and it's not built, so I have to build that one. You see here, first step, it builds the mo my module here, and the second step, it will link them together. So make will only build things that have changed, and it will detect the changes, and depending on the rule, it will build them in the correct order, so to speak. So in this case, it, it didn't compile my prog.o now because that was already compiled and the source code was not changed it last time. So it can just include that directly when linking. Uh, there is, for Fortran 90, there is one problem here. And it's, it's uh, when you're using modules, 
the compilation order is important because when you compile a, a module, it will generate certain files that are required later on in the code. So if a module uses another module, you need to make sure that the module that you're using is compiled before the one that you're using the module. And uh, we can solve this with make as well. So if you look first at the pro program here, so I have a module here, a program uh, that depends on uh, Mano and I have a module trust here. Uh, I should be an underscore here. So the uh, module underscore main, module underscore trust. Um, and this is the uh, rules uh, according to the, to the last example here. So what happens when I build this? Uh, I got an error here. So use trust. Can't open module for trust dot mod for reading at. Hmm. So the main module uses the trust module. The problem is that um, to be able to compile module main, it needs this file called trust mod. That means that the module trust has to be built before uh, the main module. So how do we solve this? So we can add a, uh, an additional dependency. So the module main here needs to be uh, built at the at last, or the, as the last step. And what we can do here, we can add, uh, in addition to the module main F90 here, we can add module dot trust dot O after this one here. That means that um, it can't build module main dot O until module trust dot O exists. So because this is a dependency, it has to build module trust first. So when we, when we do the make again now, you can see here, the first thing it does is build module trust because there is a dependency here between the object file of module trust here to the module main. And then it builds module main and then it builds module main and, and so on. So this is how you solve module dependencies. In, in, in C, you don't have this kind of um, dependency because all, all the object files will only generate O, o files. There is no uh, dependency files like this um, .mod files that are created. So uh, there are some other features in Make that can be useful. Um, as you see here before, we have to specify a lot of source code files for every rule. So in a, a log program will have, could have uh, thousands of files and you have to have a single rule for every file. Uh, so the make file can be quite large. To solve this, uh, you can use some, some tricks here. So the first, first feature that we can use is, is a variable. So instead of explicitly typing uh, out the command line for the Fortran compiler, every time you can store that as a variable. Um, and that means that you can, uh, all these kind of system dependent uh, commands can be declared in variables in the beginning and that makes it easier to read and uh, it's easier to reconfigure your build. And variables are declared by a specifying variable name and a value. And then you have to, when you use it, you have a dollar sign and parenthesis and the variable name. So it's very similar to, to bash. Uh, so I have a question here. Uh, do we write any commands after make? Uh, there are some um, options after the make. The make has a lot of command line switches, but the basic way that you don't have to do that, uh, except for certain cases. There could be that you define some variables in, in the command line that can control the build. But um, usually you only type, type make. So here is an example of, of using variables. So in this case, I want to make my rules more independent of um, uh, the compiler. So I don't want to specify the compiler and uh, in, in every rule. So I, I specify FC equals a G Fortran. So FC will contain the Fortran compiler. I have a special variable for my compiler flags uh, and also specify my executable as a executable variable here. So then the, my rules becomes executable, uh, depends on my prog, my module. I, I put my FC here, compiler, uh, and then the rule to build. 
and the compiler options are controlled here by the F flag here. So in this case, if I want to change some compiler flag, I can just change the variables here in the beginning of my make file. Uh, you can also have empty rules. So for example, in many, uh, you probably, if you have built software using make files, usually there is a, uh, you can type make clean uh, and uh, make clean will then be a empty dependency and that will be executed every time. So I had a question here, but do, do we write any commands after make? Yes, sometimes. <laughs> Uh, so you can, if you if you have the if you just specify make and, and the name, uh, make will look for that rule in the make file and they, and um, apply that. So you have make clean, make really clean, for example, make all. Um, but it's not required. You can just type make as well. Uh, some are, some are internal macros um, to make the uh, the make files even more generic. Uh, so dollar at is the target of the current rule executed. Dollar um, uh, yeah. arrow up is the name all the prerequisite, and dollar um, less than is the name of the first prerequisite. And uh, it's better to show an example here. So in this case here, I have my executable, uh, my product my module, and to link them together, I, uh, these are the uh, prerequisites here, all of them at here, uh, the target, sorry, target. Uh, and then I have, uh, so, so I don't have to specify the name here, here as well. And here is the, the compile, uh, the first one here, uh, it links, yeah, it takes all of the prerequisites of so my product, oh, my module and provides them here. So now you don't have to kind of explicitly name your things in the, in the actual recipe. So you can just use this macros that will automatically expand to the things you want. You can do the same thing with um, the source code file. So you have here, this is the target here with dollar at, this will replace by this one here. And this one here will be the first uh, of this one here. Um, so this will be replaced by myprog.f90. So now you have a generic recipe for building a source code file like this. Uh, you still have to maintain a larger number of rules here. So there are a special uh, other feature you can use is called suffix rules. And those rules are uh, rules that determine how to get from one file suffix to another suffix. So for example, going from .f90 to .o, uh, you can define a general rule for compiling Fortran code. So every source code file in your directory will depend on that rule. So you have a single rule for um, all the compilation. So here I have a .f90 .o. That means how this is a rule for going from f90 to an object file. So in this case here, I have .f compiler, compiler flags, the source code, and the target name here. And the target name will then be the .o uh, corresponding to the file name of the source code file. So in this case, it will try to build, uh, go, uh, if it finds a main.f90, it will try to build a main.o. And uh, there are, uh, make has some built-in uh, suffix uh, that it recognizes, but if you need some other ones, you can actually add them using the dot suffixes um, special rule. Then there are also some wildcard expansion you can do to kind of uh, generate a list of things. Uh, and you can also uh, substitute things in lists um, using the pop path substitute function in make. And then you can create even more generic make files. So in this case here, I can uh, generate a list of 490 files and I can do that by specifying this wildcard here, .f90. So that now I have a list of 490 files. I can have a list of objects here by using the pos substitute f90 with .o and input is f90 files. 
So then I get a list of O files for every uh, source code file I have in my uh, current directory. Uh, note that these rules are used the colon equals to assign. So it's it's not an equal sign. You have a colon equal to use these. So if we continue here, I can, for example, uh, create a uh, link together an executable in a very easy way by just uh, specifying a list of objects here. So this will link together every object that is specified in this list. So now there is no dependency of, of, of the source code files for my rules. It's completely generic. Uh, there is another uh, pat, um, rule type that is called pattern rules. It's very similar to the suffix rules. Um, and this is also a recommending way of doing this uh, instead of using the suffix rules. And it uses the percent operator in the same way as the wildcard functions. Uh, um, so here you have a percent O, colon, percent F. This is a suffix, uh, or that's called pattern rule. And this is the for compiling a single source code file to a O file here. So this will automatically be expanded to every source code file in your current directory. Um, I still use the objects here to figure out my object files here. Uh, I can also provide a single dependency here my module depends on my modules O, and it will figure out which of these it has to compile before the other one. So this was uh, make. Uh, and I think it, it's very uh, useful if you want to maintain larger projects, because it will, if you have 1,000 files and you only change one of them, only one file will be recompiled. The, com the linker step will be also provided, will be performed again, but it um, it makes the life of compiling your code much, much easier and also more consistent. Uh, there is another way. Uh, so when you start uh, doing platform independent make files, so if you want to have a make file that can work on Windows, Linux, and Mac, uh, your make files will also be very complicated because it's it's very different to compile code on the different platforms. Um, so one way of solving this is, is using a, a more advanced build system. And, and this is a, something you can use with something called CMake. And CMake is a cross-platform build system. And it's actually a meta build system, but it, it doesn't build anything itself. So what it does is actually generate build files for different platforms and, and different build systems itself. So it can build make files. And it can be build make files of different uh, flavors. There are several of them. But it can also build project files for Visual Studio, Eclipse, uh, Xcode, uh, uh, what's a small, um, and there are some other uh, platform uh, development environments as well. And CMake is actually a complete programming language itself. So you uh, you write your your uh, descriptions of your, uh, your your program in a special language. Uh, this is a minimal version of a CMake file. So the first thing you write in your make file or CMake file is what kind of version you are using of CMake. That is also to be able to be uh, backwards compatible if you, you're uh, uh, running it on a newer system with newer CMake. It can, okay, this is CMake 3, so then I have these features available. The first real part of your pro project is uh, the project statement. Here you will uh, tell CMake what your project is named. And a project can consist of multiple executables. It can consist of libraries. So the project, the simple name here is just the name of the project. It's not the name of your executable. Uh, Fortran is not uh, available by default. So the first thing, if you want to compile Fortran code, is to enable language Fortran. That will activate support for uh, the Fortran language in, in CMake. Uh, to create an executable, you use the statement add executable. Uh, you give it a name here, simple in this case. And then the source code files 
for all your so Fortran source. And that's it. Now it will generate, from this you can generate a make file, uh, build a project file for Visual Studio or project file for uh, QD Creator and, and so on. So it's the complete, you don't have to do anything more than this. Uh, the make file generated here will contain a clean section. It will contain uh, all the build rules of Fortran. It also handles the dependencies of module files in Fortran automatically. So that is the only thing you have to write. And also, this, if you want to provide your source code, you, you put your source code files in the directory. You put your CMake files there as well. And that is what you distributed to the users of your um, the users of your program, they will in, in turn generate a make file themselves and build it, uh, or a project file for a development environment and so on. So it's it kind of adds an additional layer that is platform neutral, uh, describes your program in in a neutral way. Um, you use it by so like the make file file naming here. Uh, CMake expects a file called cmakelist.txt. It's, it's kind of odd, but that's the way it is. Um, and then I have my source code file, my prog here. So the first thing I do uh, when I is to run CMake. So CMake and dot. And CMake lot, when it first starts up, it checks your environment. So it checks for uh, are there any compilers available? Uh, what kind of compilers are available? Uh, are they you? Uh, uh, can they be used? Are they working? Uh, and it also checks kind of if you're with what platform you're on. And then it, the final step, it will generate a make file. So when I do ls here again, you see here, it has generated a make file for me. So it's that file you are using. You will use to build your software, not not the C make file. So make the, it will generate a make file here. So if I just press make, it will use stuff like this. It will start. Uh, checking for the dependency of the simple targets, uh, and then it will build the source code files, and, and finally it will link the executable together. <coughs> so usually when you do CMake, you don't do this. This is just a for illustration example, the simplest example I could find. As you can see here, it will generate a lot of uh, other stuff in your directory. CMake cache, um, there will be a CMake files directory, and to not kind of uh, clut clutter up your build environment, usually what you do when you're building software with CMake is that you, you create a special build directory. So before you run CMake, you do make your build. You go into this build directory and you do CMake dot dot. That means it will CMake will look for a CMake text file in your source code tree, but it will generate all the build files in my build directory. In that way, you can when you're done, you can just erase the build directory and start over uh, instead of kind of cleaning up my source code directory and, and, and which can be much more complicated. But this works just as fine. Uh, CMake also supports uh, building different kind of versions of your program. So by default, it, it can handle something called a release binary but this can also uh, create a debug uh, binary. And you control, that, control this by specifying the CMake build type variable at the command line of CMake. So CMake minus D, CMake build type equals to release. That will generate the build files to create an optimized binary for your code. By default, it will generate a debug version of your code. A debug version is that it contains debugging information that you can run in the debugger, but it will also not turn on all the optimization features. Uh, library dependencies uh, can also be handled. So in addition to add executable here, so if you want your program to depend on certain libraries, you specify that using the target link libraries um, instruction. You have to specify which target this uh, library a lot of libraries should be added to. So in this case, simple. I need a blouse library and I build, build a, need a math library. Uh, it will also try to resolve these to different file names on different platforms. So on a, on a Linux and Mac version, blouse will be translated to 
uh, libblast.a or libblast.so. On a Windows platform, it will be translated into blast.lib, which is the corresponding library uh, file names you have on Windows, for example. So it handles lib many of these kind of annoying things that are different between the platforms uh, really kind of automatically. Uh, another nice thing is that as this is a uh, programming language, you can actually do logical statements in your build uh, CMake file. So for example, if you want to do special things on different platforms, you can have an if statement to, to check. So for example, if I'm running on a Unix platform, that could be Mac or Linux, um, it will do certain things. If you're on a Apple platform, you can specify Apple and you do, can do things on an Apple platform and on a Linux on Win32, which is a window platform, uh, you can do different things. So you can build a sophisticated uh, set of uh, checks yourself to kind of handle the builds in different way, depending on different platforms. And for the user, uh, the user will only see one file and create, he, he doesn't have to look at this. It will generate the correct files for the correct, for the different platforms. So this is a simple example here. So if I'm on a Unix machine, I want to create an executable here, a multiple. Uh, I will link with BLOS and M here. If I'm on a Windows platform, I will link with BLOS32, for example. Uh, and if it's not the Windows here and not Unix, uh, okay, this is not a support configuration. This will stop the build. As with make, you can create variables. So you use set and then the variable name and the contents of the variable. You access variable, the, the value in the variable using uh, dollar and then a curly bracket. So if you want to print the my var variable here, you do message uh, dollar sign, uh, curly bracket and the variable name that will um, return the, the, the value of the, the variable. You can create lists using the set command here again. So my list A, B, and C will create a list of the characters A, B, and C. And you can loop over lists, for example, like this. Um, you see it's a complete language. Uh, you can specify optimization flags for the different uh, release versions here. So in this case, CMake Fortran flags release will have contained by default the standard Opt uh, optimization flag for the, the select the compiler. There are some default values, but you can, if you want to specify very specifically what version you can use this variable here. Uh, you can also set the Fortran compiler using the CMake Fortran compiler. And uh, you can see here that you can, you can create really complicated rules here. So for example, if the compiler is G Fortran, use these rules for release and these rules for debug. And if it's an Intel compiler like iFort, I will do this kind of rules and so on. So you can get check, kind of check, do this kind of checks and, and modify your build uh, in a very efficient way and uh, to sort of get exactly what you want. Another nice thing, as I said before, it's not only make files it can generate. So you can generate project files, which are uh, build rules for development environments. And, and uh, CMake supports Visual Studio, Eclipse, NetBeans, Xcode, and many more of these development environments. Uh, you can select using the J option here on the command line, which generator to use. So by default, it will generate make files. But, but you can specify here, uh, for example, minus J, Eclipse, Unix, make files. Uh, this will generate a, a project file for the Eclipse environment. And then also specific project inside that for your Fortran code. Uh, and Eclipse uses make files to actually build, so it will generate a suitable make files as well for the Eclipse development environment. So that was my lecture for today. Uh,